Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Some of you have already met me or maybe have me in classes. For some of you, this is the first time we've met, but I look forward to getting to know a lot of you more. So I'm very excited to introduce today Dr. Figdor. I'm Jennifer Stuffel. I'm a colleague of Dr. Figdor's, and in the crowd, we have folks from Upper Iowa University working with different agencies, partners, our alumni. It's really exciting to have you all here, and I'm so excited to see this room being filled up with plant enthusiasts. Right. So for those of you that don't know, both Dr. Figdor and I are exceptionally passionate about plants. Dr. Figdor has been surveying plants of Fayette County and all of Northeast Iowa, and his passion has always existed about plants, but I would say his enthusiasm has only grown since I've known him <laughs> and have been here. So. I really enjoy watching you go out with your students and keying out plants and drawing me in to look at the individual plant parts. And I'm so excited to hear about the recent work he's been doing uh, to add on to some of the other speaker series talks that he's given. So today's talk is gonna focus on the most current 20 years, but we are also gonna tie back to historical connections, right. which will be really important. And this also is going to relate to the great and ongoing work that several of our alumni have done. So we're also really grateful and thankful to the Parker, Fox, and Gable families. So thank you all for continuing to support science, students, staff, faculty, and nature enthusiasts. Thanks for coming. But you're here to listen to Dr. Figdor. So I will turn our attention there. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dr. Stuffel. <clears throat> I know Dr. Stuffel really works tirelessly to get uh, people here for the uh, Field Science Speaker Series, and so it's a thrill for me to just to be able to be here and share some of the things that I've been doing for the past couple decades or so, I guess. <laughs> uh, for me, again, I've learned a lot. She mentioned the Parker, Gable, uh, Fox families. I've learned a lot from the individuals that are from those families that are still around, their ancestors. We're gonna be talking about uh, uh, one individual in particular, Charles Coleman Parker, Dr. C.C. Parker. And hopefully you'll see an underlying theme. Yes, it's a, it's a talk about plants, but hopefully you'll see that the underlying theme is really about community, okay? Uh, he was, he exemplified the community spirit, I think. And here we are, students, faculty, staff, people from all around here, the, the, the town, regional area, uh, from around the region, and we're all part of this community. I want to make sure, and particularly students, you need to know it. You are part of this community, okay? And by being a part of the community, then you're entrusted to do your part on the community. You're going to see Dr. Parker went way above and beyond uh, when we talk about some of the uh, amazing things that he did when he was uh, here helping to start Upper Iowa and helping to start the town of Fayette. Okay, so um, uh, hopefully we want to make sure you kind of get at least a little bit of that sense of that history. And then, yes, we'll talk plants as well because, you know, that's what I most enjoy the most. I do want to give a, a shout out. I will have at the end here uh, a, a, a slide with a bunch of people on, but I wanted to give a shout out to a couple people in particular that have been helping me uh, lately with my particular projects. Uh, and of course, uh, Sam Reed, <clears throat> uh, Samantha Reed uh, was a student here just a couple years ago, finished up, uh, and she has been working uh, with my herbarium samples, trying to mount uh, them, uh, label them. She's digitized some of these samples. She's just done a phenomenal job, so I really appreciate uh, her help. And then uh, we were out in the uh, uh, field with some sedges, uh, along with Joshua Crosby, who's here. And uh, Joshua, again, is our post-baccalaureate uh, land management coordinator. And uh, I don't think I'd be able to get half the stuff that I wanted to get done uh, in the past few years if it hadn't been for Joshua kind of coming in and stepping in and helping out with that. So once again, I do appreciate both of them tremendously. But there are so many other people I want to thank as well as we go along. Okay. Uh, again, just so you understand uh, the types of things that we want to try to con uh, cover in here, um, one of the main things that I've been doing recently is a countywide survey. Okay. So I want to make sure you understand why. Why would I bother doing a survey of the plants in the county? So we'll try to tie that in a little bit 
and talk about how that usually goes with the documentation of those types of surveys, which is collecting uh, plant specimens, herbarium specimens. Uh, we have a herbarium I'm, right now. I'm the herbarium curator for the Upper Iowa Herbarium. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the history of that and the types of things that are in our collection. Okay. And then, uh, again, I'll try to get to, uh, honestly, I have preliminary in here because it's very important for you to understand. I've been working on this collection for about 20 years, okay? And it was only two weeks ago where I actually tried to look at the database and try to make some sense of all of the stuff, okay? So we're only gonna scratch the surface. It's probably good for you. <laughs> or we might be here for three or four hours, <laughs> okay? But we wanna try to go through some of these things as best as we can. First of all, it's always really important to really understand why. Why, why would we do surveys? What is the, the purpose for some of these types of things? And again, I, I, uh, there's several quotes. This is a quote that I really like. Uh, again, part of uh, community now, we, yes, we're talking about uh, community of people, but also uh, we want to look at the larger sense uh, of the uh, biological communities, ecological communities from that standpoint, and we'll focus again in here on the plant communities. Um, you need diverse plant communities in order to be able to have uh, the proper community structure, as it says. Uh, a lot of that community, a lot of that uh, structure, if you will, uh, and diversity was wiped out uh, along the way when uh, uh, Iowa was, uh, uh, went through its uh, initial uh, settlement, European settlement, say. And so uh, some of that now we're realizing we really need to get back to, okay? So uh, being able to restore areas, what used to be tons of prairie all over Iowa, we need to try to restore, of course, not all of that, but at least uh, restore some of that wetlands and so on and be able to have uh, di uh, diverse plant species in, uh, in those uh, areas uh, in order to maintain that uh, structure. Okay, there's so many things that plants can do for us, obviously. Uh, they're providing us with uh, food. Uh, many plants will provide us with uh, medicinal types of drugs, pharmaceutical types of drugs. Uh, and so on, and again, uh, the, uh, the impact of plants on the environment, on water quality, and so on, is very, very critical. So we wanna to try to touch base on, uh, or, or this is why we need to, to take a look at that. In order to be able to know um, how to restore something, you need to know what you're restoring it back to, okay? So this is where the surveys become very important. Fortunately, there were some surveys that were done here in Fayette County, one of them, again, by uh, the fellow, uh, Dr. C.C. Parker, that we'll be talking about, but uh, a couple others we'll see. Um, and so we have some of that historical data from uh, before the time when uh, the prairies were totally uh, uh, replaced by uh, agricultural land. Okay, so, uh, well, not totally, of course, but uh, <clears throat> Uh, so we, we have that uh, information, but now then we also need to know if those plants are still around, okay? So a uh, fellow by the name of William Norris, uh, I just saw this in uh, the uh, Iowa uh, Native Plant Society. He published this little article, but I've been uh, uh, knowing some of these botanists here, six botanists, I've, been, I've known them for quite a while, and uh, they've always been encouraging me to do some of the survey work. So they did a survey of uh, the uh, plant communities in the Story County, countywide sur survey. Story County would be where uh, Ames is located. Uh, so again, six uh, very dedicated botanists, three decades. Okay. Uh, again, I'll do a little bit of comparison. Yes, 4,000 plant specimens uh, from 1,230 plant species or subspecies. Uh, so they did a tremendous amount of work. I haven't seen all the data from that just yet. They, he had a little bit, uh, Bill Norris had a little bit of that data in uh, this particular newsletter. But uh, again, the, the big push in that newsletter was that we need more of these county surveys. Only two, we've got 99 counties in Iowa, I think. Only two of them uh, have had county surveys published recently. Okay. And we need to have that recent data so we can compare it back to the past and see what do we have, what don't we have, what, is there anything we can do to, to work through the managing of that, say? Okay. So again, they really encouraged, they actually had about uh, 12, 15 points in that little bulletin newsletter that they wrote to encourage 
uh, other botanists and again, quote, citizen scientists to be able to uh, go through these county surveys. Um, I, I, I've been doing it for quite a while. <laughs> I'm about there. I'm not ready to publish yet, but at least hopefully Fayette will be number three or number four or number five uh, as we go along from that standpoint. Okay. Uh, again, to understand, uh, you do the surveys and you will collect or document uh, what, you coll uh, what you found with the herbarium samples. So you want to make sure you know what a herbarium is. Uh, basically a collection of uh, preserved plant samples. Um, <clears throat> Lots of times, uh, if you can, you'll try to get the whole plant, dry it out. I'll talk through with you how to do that process. Uh, but sometimes maybe you might only be able to get parts of the plant. If you can get roots and things, it's helpful, but not always necessary in order to be able to identify things. But once you have those plants, like for example with this one here, the black-eyed Susan, we know where, uh, relatively where it was collected. We don't have the GPS coordinates from 1878, okay, but we have some kind of an idea that was collected somewhere near Decor by this particular individual, so we know what that individual's correct uh, uh, credentials are. Um, and again, we know uh, roughly the time period where it was collected. A lot of the earlier surveys didn't have as much uh, detailed data on that, and that has changed now, but uh, still uh, that information is better than none, okay. So uh, it's important to have that information so we can uh, archive that information. And, uh, and, and know that at this point in time, at this snapshot in time, uh, we have a record of all of the plants that were at a particular location at a particular time um, in a period of history, if you will. Okay? So knowing that information and then being able to use that to track. We, if we have that information from the 1870s, can we use that now to see where we're at now and track changes that have happened? Okay, so that's the importance of doing that. And usually the specimens that you create uh, that are the documented evidence of a survey, that a survey was done in a particular area, they're usually referred to as voucher specimens. Okay, you've got a receipt of what you did, where, uh, where you found it, when you found it, and so on. So to do herbarium, uh, make herbarium specimens, and again, I know some people in the room have done that before. I've had them in the past. Some of them in front here are going to be doing that in a couple of weeks. So uh, again, the processing part basically is usually you'll be outside in the, in the wild, but usually to demonstrate, I'll, I'll have a plant from uh, the greenhouse. In this case, we've got a past flower here. Uh, we, uh, you collect uh, the uh, plant, uh, remove as much of the uh, soil from the roots if you're going to uh, press the roots as well. And then you'll go through a process of trying to dry that plant out. Uh, if you don't, uh, again, press it to try to wick the moisture away from it, it'll kind of dry just like leaves will dry in the fall, and it'll just become crumbly and break all apart. Okay? So you want to try to put it into a press where you're uh, systematically trying to wick out as much moisture as possible. Uh, in a, a, a very organized way so that the, uh, in, the integrity of the plant tissue will stay intact even though it won't be living anymore. Uh, you won't have as much crumbling, if you will, and breaking apart. So you go through a process, you can actually press, in, uh, press uh, samples between newspaper, for example, and then you'll put them into a plant press and you'll let them dry in that press. Typically that press will have uh, uh, corrugated cardboard and, cer and certain blotting and wicking uh, materials that will be able to kind of draw that water out, uh, fairly quickly out of that, uh, the plant sample to uh, better preserve it. So usually you'll leave them in a plant press uh, at least you know, a week. Sometimes you might leave them in, uh, actually some people leave them in for months and years okay, before they process them. All right. Once they are dry, then you can go ahead and uh, mount the samples. So that process usually involves uh, to, to preserve that, those samples uh, to the best quality so they will last for long periods of time. You want to keep them from, away from anything that has acid. Okay? So you use acid-free glue to glue them onto paper. You use acid-free paper because the acids, again, will, will uh, eventually uh, uh, corrode, destroy the uh, plant tissues. Okay? Uh, you use uh, acid-free uh, labels. Uh, you will uh, pack them in acid-free sh uh, sh protective sheets okay? uh, so that hopefully you'll be able to have uh, them around for quite a while. Again, this is one of the uh, Parker samples that I'll be talking about uh, a little bit, probably a 140-year-old sample. 140-year-old 100, sample. Okay, I can only hope. 
my samples will be around for 140 years old. I know I won't be, but uh, hopefully my samples will make it, all right? And again, samples from some of the other students that have helped with these pro uh, projects, okay? And then, uh, yes, then labeling. We'll talk a little bit about labeling as we go along. Okay, um, the fellow that started this off in the Stan Warner community, uh, at least in my mind, Dr. Charles Coleman Parker, the first physician uh, at Fayette. And it was last night when I was kind of looking through this stuff, I was like, oh, he's born in 1823, 1823, 23. How old would he have been? 200 years old. Oh my God, 200, sorry, oh my God, 200 years old. Okay, 200 years ago, okay, was when this fellow was born. And he's still making an impact today, at least in this university, okay? Again, he went to medical school. Again, he was born in Ohio, went to medical school. And again, about when he was in his 30s, he decided he wanted to uh, see the world. He was married. He just had a kid, as a matter of fact, a little boy. Uh, and so he uh, was looking for places to, to uh, uh, move his family and uh, stopped in Fayette, saw what he liked, and decided to uh, uh, take up residence here. He was the first physician for the town of Fayette. Okay. Um, at the time, uh, two years later, Upper Iowa uh, was, uh, uh, went through their, their first uh, year of school. Okay, so the, it used to be called, again, the Fayette Seminary. But, uh, so Upper Iowa started in 1857, and he was there. Okay? Uh, they needed somebody to teach science. He was there. Community. He was a physician. He had plenty of things to do, but... He, had, he came and he taught chemistry, you know. And then he'd go out, actually he'd go out, he'd be, he'd be looking for plants. That was his hobby. He'd be looking for plants and he, one day he brought back a pine tree, or sorry, an elm tree. He brought back an elm tree and he sat it down in front of the class and said, we're going to plant this out, uh, out, out here. <laughs> uh, now there's a rock out there and now we have an elm that his great-grandchildren planted because that original tree is gone now, okay? So, uh, again, he didn't have to be part of the board of directors, uh, uh, board of trustees for Upper Iowa, but he was for on and off probably for 40 years, community, okay? If that's not enough, when the uh, Civil War came along, okay, um, and many of the uh, male uh, students here at Upper Iowa actually volunteered for the Army and he volunteered to serve as their surgeon. Okay. So he picked up and went with them to war. All right. uh, again, he, was, uh, he served in uh, certain battles, a couple battles, very bloody battles. Okay. Civil War was very bloody. And again, he had, uh, he had his hands full when he was working with uh, the wounded. Okay. At that point in time, Typically, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, when uh, 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 the uh, uh, soldiers were uh, wounded, uh, if uh, the, the types of mini balls that were used at that point in time used to really destroy tissue so much so that uh, you had the only way you could control and keep, uh, keep the, the soldiers alive would be to amputate. So again, very often they had to do a lot of amputation of limbs. Okay, so uh, Jeanette Garcia is our archivist, and she's been uh, trying to do a, uh, write a, a biography for Dr. Uh, Coleman, C.C. Uh, Parker, we call him C.C. Parker. And there's a story that was, uh, there's a little quote in here that was uh, mentioned by his uh, grandson about uh, when he was in battle, or well, when he was uh, serving as a surgeon taking care of the wounded, having to do amputations, one after the other after the other, in a small uh, cabin. They had to take the amputated limbs and throw them out the window. Okay. And they just kept doing that, and kept doing that, him and his assistant. The quote from his uh, grandson, Tom Gable, in spite of my grandfather's slight stature, he was very strong, and I can recall the story of how he had to go out to push the amputated arms and legs away from the window through which he had thrown them in order to be able to throw out more. Okay. That's community. <laughs> That's dedication. 
I can't, I could never be that dedicated. But uh, hopefully at least I can do a little bit for him and for his herbarium. We'll see, all right? Uh, Dr. Parker's uh, family members uh, come back fairly regularly, once a year, for the most part. Okay? Uh, great-grandchildren, great-great-grandchildren, I think even great-great-great-grandchildren now, kind of coming back. And again, at one point when they uh, came back, they uh, decided to uh, entrust us with some of uh, the Civil War artifacts and artifacts from Dr. Parker's life. So when they came back that, uh, I think it was about 18, or sorry, uh, 20, 2017, 2016, 2017, they came back to give us these materials. And I happened to be there when they were uh, uh, giving them to the archivist in the, li in the library. And one of the Parker family members said, hey, do you, uh, P Dr. Parker had a herbarium. Do you remember anything about that herbarium? Do you have any of the samples? And I was like, I'm pretty sure I do. And I went. Uh, came back here, found a couple samples, took them over to the Parker family. They were so impressed <laughs> that they were like, hey, can you find us more? And can you restore them? Because again, some of them were in uh, not so great a shape. Okay. So uh, they did give us, uh, again, the, uh, um, uh, some of these medical supplies. They are over in the library. There's a uh, display over in the library. Uh, these were when they first brought them, but now they're kind of nicely displayed over there and archived. Uh, his medical bag, okay, uh, and again, he used to have to go make uh, house calls on a horse, okay, and when he was out, he'd be riding through prairie areas, he'd see a nice flower, he'd go down, pick it, press it, take it back with him, all right. Uh, medical supplies, I'm not a medical doctor. I'm, not, I'm the fake doctor, the PhD, so I don't know what all those things are. But I do know microscope and slides. Okay, I work with microscopy here, so I know that at least. Okay. Uh, we even have the bone saw that he used in the Civil War over in the, arc, in the uh, display. Okay. So once again, as he was uh, uh, doing all these other things, board of trustees, uh, teaching, uh, and he didn't teach every year, but he, was, uh, he taught uh, quite a bit. And as he was doing all these things, again, he was collecting these herbarium samples because that was, uh, again, a, a hobby of his. But he could also use them to help teach, just like I'm using herbarium samples to help my students, okay, to learn uh, the plants and so on. So he had a collection. The collection was probably about 500 uh, plant specimens. And he donated it to Upper Iowa in uh, his later life. He actually died, I believe, in 1906. So sometime before that, he donated his collection. And on all of his collection, it was stamped with this herbarium of Upper Iowa University. So that was the first herbarium that we had, was his materials. Okay. Uh, since then, I'm going to show you and talk to you a little bit about how that collection has gotten built over time and what's happened to it. But um, when they were here, like I said, they were so pleased that we were trying to preserve uh, Dr. Parker's legacy, C.C. Parker's legacy, that one of his great-grandchildren, uh, his great-grandson, uh, James D. Parker, who happens to also be a physician, okay, retired physician, um, <clears throat> he asked if we could do some restoration, and I said, okay, if we do it, I want to do this and this and this. So I set out these three goals. He's like, sounds good, we'll fund it. Okay? And so the first one was restoring Dr. C.C. Parker's herbarium collection, so we'll talk to you about that. The second phase, uh, there are other historical collections. I'll, I'll go through a little bit of that. We're working on those. And then that th third phase I had to throw in there is, how about we make sure that we put my stuff in there? Why? Why would I, is it just that I wanted to have my stuff in there? Not necessarily. Again, in order to make uh, any good sense of the stuff, the 140-year-old material that's there, you've got to know the new stuff too. It, it leads. Uh, a lot of uh, credibility, if you will, uh, if you have that. And we were missing and lacking that for a while, we'll see. So again, we wanted to try to uh, bring, bring us back into the fold of uh, a truly historical archival location. Okay? Uh, it made perfect sense then. Very often, herbaria at universities are named after somebody who was uh, uh, instrumental to that institution from the standpoint of their uh, botanical samples. For example, Iowa State, they have named their uh, herbarium the Ada Hayden uh, 
herbarium. You've probably even heard of Ada Hayden before, again, a uh, very important botanist uh, uh, that taught at Iowa State. Uh, and uh, so we thought we should do the same thing. We'll ne rename our herbarium the C.C. Parker Herbarium of Upper Iowa University. So again, the whole collection is called the C.C. Uh, Parker Herbarium. But then within the whole collection is his own individual collections for the, uh, for, uh, that he collected, which is basically this. Again, uh, we know from uh, a Collegian article that he collected approximately 500 samples. Okay. Within 500, or sorry, within five miles of Fayette. Okay, we'll show you what that looks like here in a little bit. Uh, and again, the specimens were most likely collected between the 1860s and 1870s, although we don't have a lot of, uh, we don't have exact uh, time periods of when he collected, which would be the, the holy grail for the uh, uh, collection uh, process, archival process. Okay, um, we couldn't find all 500, but I was able to find 411 of them. Not bad for 140 years. Okay, not bad. Um, <clears throat> 305 of them were from Fayette County, and so we're very interested in that, those, obviously. But he was from Ohio. Uh, uh, he lived right across the border from Kentucky. Every uh, couple, uh, every now and then, he'd go home in the summer and he'd do some collecting, and he brought back 106 samples. Well, we found 106 samples from those areas as well, okay? We know a lot about this because the fellow who came along uh, after him, but who was a contemporary, a fellow by the name of Bruce Fink, Dr. Bruce Fink. Again, he was a botanist, a lichenologist, if that makes any difference to you, if you know what lichens are. Okay. Uh, so he uh, came uh, in the 1890s, was here in the 1890s, and he actually uh, did a, a more thorough survey. Again, he was a true botanist. Uh, Dr. Parker really, again, was a physician who liked to dabble with botany, okay? But he knew his stuff, we'll say. And so he uh, did work with Dr. Parker. He mentions in his paper, the paper that he did for the uh, Proceedings of the Iowa Academy of Science in 1897, uh, he uh, mentioned 700 species, and throughout the paper he mentions samples that he had, uh, voucher samples that he had gotten from Dr. Parker. We found some of those, maybe not all of them, but some of those, okay? Dr. Fink had 700, uh, again, had uh, his own herbarium collection, but I think some of that he gave to other agencies. I think some of it is in the Smithsonian Institution, and I kind of like to go there and see it if I can, okay? But haven't gotten there yet, but maybe. Uh, we still have about 99 of his specimens. Again, we've got about 400 of Parker's specimens. So I uh, asked uh, Dr. James Parker, again, the great-grandson, can we do both collections at the same time for that phase one? They went hand in hand. We needed uh, Bruce Fink's information in order to provide credibility that yes, these samples Dr. Parker collected. Some of those samples didn't even have his name on them, Dr. Parker's name on them. So I, I had to do, me and others had to do a little bit of, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, forensics to, to figure that out, handwriting, looking at handwriting and so on, just to kind of figure out. And uh, again, I got uh, an expert to buy it uh, because I think it is credible, so uh, we'll talk about that a little bit. So uh, as we work through phase one, um, we got, we've, we've got that done now. Phase one is now complete, okay? We had to, we reviewed the samples and I got, I'll show you in a minute, I got an expert to help us with that to make sure, usually scientific names, they've changed quite a bit from 140 years ago. We know so much more about these names. So we had to update those names. Uh, I, had, I got somebody to help me with that. Uh, and you call that process annotation, okay, when you're updating those scientific names to the more current, correct, correctly accepted scientific names. Uh, archival labeling. Uh, again, we'll show you the, the labeling that uh, basically that, that was done. And then, like I said, many of these samples were in very poor repair. Some samples, it took me probably two or three hours working with a sample. Pick up this piece of leaf, put it here. Pick up that piece of leaf, glue it here. Okay? It was like a puzzle sometimes. Most of them weren't that bad, but many samples took at least 20 minutes or more. 500 samples. Okay? So that took some time. Uh, stamping and barcoding with the C.C. Parker uh, logo, if you will, 
uh, re recording all of the stuff in the database, and then again, we, uh, we digitally, high quality digitally scanned all 512 samples, and we put them into a repository. We have them here as well, those digital samples. You can access them through, I think, the library, the archives, but we, we put them uh, as well um, into a repository with JSTOR called Global Plants, okay? Uh, international, anybody could see them. Well, if they belong to JSTOR, Global Plants. All right, and now we have these samples properly stored. Uh, it, it, I shudder to think of how they were stored before I was able to kind of get to take care of them. Okay, but now they're in good shape. Okay, feeling good about it. Fellow who helped me with this was a fellow by the name of Dr. Tom Lammers. He's from uh, Iowa. Uh, he, but he, uh, again, he ended up as a, a professor at University of Wisconsin Oshkosh, but he knew so much about the flora of Iowa in those early days. He was from Burlington, and so he actually uh, knew about all these other collections. Strangely enough, herbarium collections made by physicians. Why were physicians so interested in herbarium collections? Where did you get medicines then? From plants. Okay. So knowing your plants and the medicines that are associated with them was very helpful to a physician at that time. All right? And we found Dr. Parker was just another one of those that was doing that. So, uh, like I said, Dr. Uh, uh, Lammers were, was able to really bring that credibility that I needed. I, I'm not a uh, taxonomist, botanist taxonomist. Uh, I'm more of a plant uh, geneticist. But, and so, um, but again, when you're in a small college, very often you're kind of teaching all kinds of different things. Uh, but uh, I definitely had an interest in this, and, but I didn't have, again, that... Uh, assurance, I guess, that I, I really could do this the right way, the way that Dr. Uh, Parker wanted us to do it. So I uh, got an expert. Uh, he put together a, a restatement paper after he looked at all these samples and helped uh, me to organize things. Uh, again, he just did the annotation uh, and, and made the label that we printed out. And uh, so he just did that part. We did all of the rest of the parts. Okay. But then he did this uh, paper this restatement that said, uh, this is the species that was mentioned in Fink's paper, and this is what it's called now. And here's a, a bit of information that you should know if you uh, know anything about uh, classification. This is why it was classified this way. And here's another, and, and that's, that's the wrong name. It's gotta be this name. And so we've got this nice paper that kind of outlines what was here and the current names for all of those from, uh, if not published, but from Dr. Lammers. So going on to phase two, I was like, Dr. Lammers, can you help me with phase two? He was like, I don't have to. You're ready. <laughs> You're ready. Go for it. Okay, here's the, here's the restatement. It's all yours, buddy. And so that, I've been doing that. He gave me the confidence that what I'm, gonna, what I'm doing now and in the future uh, will be uh, worthy, <laughs> I guess is the best way to look at it when I think about it. Uh, again, uh, before uh, this process, this, is, this was Dr. Uh, Parker's label here. It has this little sticker on Herbarium of Upper Iowa University. Pretty much nobody else's, no, nothing else in the, in the uh, herbarium had that sticker on, so we knew it was his. Okay? Some of them had writing on. Uh, they usually had the species name written on it, and we could match these, this handwriting to letters from the Civil War, that he wrote to his wife in the Civil War, okay? So we knew that these were Dr. Dr. Parker. I mean, I'm not a handwriting expert, but still, it seemed, uh, seemed to be pretty good. Plus that, plus everything. So we put all these things together, so we feel comfortable to be able to say that these samples were collected by Dr. C.C. Parker within five miles of Fayette between 1860 and 1880. And the fact that Tom Lammers put his name on it, again, like I said, leads, lends that credibility that we needed, that I needed, because Upper Iowa hasn't been at that level for a while, and we want to make sure that we kind of get back to that level for, for this herbarium stuff, okay? Bar, uh, barcoding, similar to what's uh, used in, uh, in the library. Uh, and again, everything with C.C. Parker Herbarium, okay? Phase two. Okay. In phase two, uh, I'm gonna kind of gl gloss through these a little bit, but there were some uh, important collections. This is the collection that I'm working on right now. Uh, again, 1800s, so we've got a few good 
quali high quality collections in the 1800s. Uh, one of them was for a centennial exp exhibition. Uh, United States okay, became a, a nation in 1776. So in 1876, they had a big party in Philadelphia, centennial celebration, and they told all the states to bring something from your state uh, that you think is cool. What did they bring? Herbarium samples, okay? Because nobody knew about Iowa and what was, what was in Iowa, and we had all this diverse type of uh, plant life. So we took nine, uh, uh, J.C. Arthur arranged 929 samples. 929 samples, 929 different species or subspecies took to uh, Philadelphia. Do we have those exact samples? No, we probably, I don't think so. We have samples that were with that collection there. Uh, usually you do duplicates. So we got some duplicates from the people who collected it. J.C. Arthur collected some of these. Uh, we, we got 317 of them. Okay. And these, have, these do have more archival information on, but again, we need to re-annotate, so we're uh, re-annotating those, okay? Uh, uh, fellow from Decorah, uh, Dr. Holloway collected uh, many of the ones that we have, okay? And then again, we have just a couple from a fellow by the name of C.E. Bessie, who uh, was uh, very instrumental in some of the classification schemes that are used nowadays. The ch classification schemes made a very big change in the, uh, the way that they were looked at phylogenetically, and uh, Bessie helped with that. We've got a couple of his samples. I think that's really special, okay? Uh, my phenomenal students that went here that made some nice collections. This one, Dr. Stella Mason, alumni, alumna from uh, 1885. Again, very, very important in women's suffrage. She was from Mason City. She went on to uh, get uh, to become a medical a physician and a surgeon, <laughs> collecting plants. Okay, collecting plants. We have 143 of the ones that she collected the year that she graduated. Okay, I've got them. We got to work on them. I think you, you databased them. Yeah. yeah. We got to now. We got to work on them. All right. But a phenomenal story, and I can't wait to dig into that story. We haven't had a chance to just yet. Uh, I'm going to say B. Shimmick. Everybody calls him B. Shimmick. <laughs> uh, again, from University of Iowa. Uh, again, now this was at 1800s and uh, late 1800s, early 1900, uh, 1900s, when he uh, did collections all over Iowa. 200,000 plant specimens, again. And he just handed out his collections to everybody all over the place. And we got well, we got at least 92, probably got more, but those are 92 that we found. We need to uh, annotate those, get them up to speed for phase two. The other historical collections, Centennial Collection, the Mason Collection, the Shimmick Collection, those are the three that I'm working on for the most part. This isn't a collection, but this is kind of important. This fellow, Samuel Wood Geyser, was uh, uh, here in, in 1918, and he did survey work from around Northeast Iowa, not just in Fayette. Okay. And as he did, again, he found about 653 species that he put into a paper, but he didn't have the voucher samples. So we don't have all the stuff we need to be able to say, yep, those things are, were, were found here. We just has his, have his word that he saw them. Okay. Th that's still good, but again, it's not the gold standard. Okay. So... Uh, interesting, uh, interesting, he went on, he uh, uh, made a really name, a name for himself, in, uh, 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 I think uh, down in Texas, um, and uh, he's done a lot of work with isopods, some of you might know what isopods are. But pretty much after that, really after the stuff from Mason and Shimmick, we really don't have collections um, comprehensive collections like what we saw there with the Fink and the Parker samples. So we do have some great um, work from, from some students here. This is kind of an uh, important sp uh, specimen collected by Terry Lansgard, who's, uh, who wasn't uh, a graduate from here. Uh, and he actually even is, uh, I think, an adjunct teacher with us right now still too. Uh, this uh, sample of lupins, which uh, again, usually you will find them in gardens, but they, they, have, they did grow natively here, but nobody sees them anymore uh, in their native natural areas. And so it's thought that Terry had a, a sample from a particular time period in Fayette County for this particular lupin sample. Uh, and again, a, uh, the uh, prairie smoke, again, prairie smoke used to be all over the place. Okay, now 
I, I can think of one place in, in Fayette County where I know it is, okay, uh, naturally, and it's in our uh, remnant prairie, okay. There may be other places. I don't, I don't have everything recorded in Fayette County. Keep that in mind, all right. So phase two is in progress. Centennial collection, we've got a good handle on that. We're almost done with that, although we gotta, I got to do some more repair work. We're going to be digitizing from that standpoint. Mason and Shimmick collections, at least they're on the radar, but they may not get done real soon, but we'll try to do what we can. I didn't know what else to call it, the Vigdor collection. Okay, so um, <clears throat> starting in 2000s, right? Okay, so again, going back to Story County, six botanists, three decades, 4,000 specimens, 1,230 species. I've got 2,000 specimens, okay? How many species? Well, we'll see, all right? Not, not bad, okay? Because uh, considering I had other jobs to be doing at the same time, teaching and some administrative work and things like that, all right? Again, just to compare, uh, Fink and Parker, their collections were from five miles around Fayette is the best uh, information that we have, okay? So that's the blue circle here. Uh, places I, I didn't, I haven't collected, this is the whole county of Fayette, I haven't collected everywhere in the county of Fayette. Okay, it's just impossible. I mean, even just going out to Volga, is, it, it's just so massive, okay? So uh, I have certain little places where we've collected. I can tell you kind of where some of those locations are at some point in time, but uh, at least I think I've got a fairly good handle, uh, enough to say, yep, we've got a, a decent countywide survey con uh, uh, considering, everything considered, if you will, okay? So uh, again, I'm kind of needing to work on uh, this stuff. I've, I think I've got things uh, laid out, but uh, I still need to do labeling and um, we need to do scanning and digitizing from that standpoint. But there are some samples, like I said, I don't feel real confident with some difficult samples, so I don't know if I've got it all worked out. The data that I'm going to show you, like I said, it still has a, it has a mishmash of things in that um, <clears throat> some of it probably shouldn't be in there, so I still got a lot of sorting out to do, but I'll show you what I've got so far. Okay, and now here's where I got to go to the students here, because we're talking about things like clades, Okay, stuff like that. And so when you look at the hierarchical level, if you want to see how successful your, uh, your data is for a survey, typically you're going to be looking at the total number of species that you find. And then species can be grouped into, uh, related species can be grouped into a genus. Okay, the genus then can be several related genera can be grouped into families. So usually look at the number of families you collected. Okay, and then how many species you have in those families, and then how many species that you have total. And technically it could be species or subspecies when you get down to the nitty gritty of the annotating. Okay? Uh, for the angiosperms, uh, 93 families, 625 species. Sorry, some of my students have a question about this on here, so I'm just trying to make sure they... Uh, 157 of them, monocots, most of you probably understand, monocots versus dicots, monocots usually are things like grasses, okay, orchids are in monocots, lilies, stuff like that. So uh, 157 are monocots. All the rest of these technically are what we used to call the dicots, but now, again, I've got to make sure that I'm teaching a little bit to my students. We know that we're breaking these things up now, and these are some of the clades uh, that we break these things up. So all of the basal eudicots, if you will, come back to a common ancestor. Okay? All of the superrosids come back to a common ancestor. Um, an ancestor that, again, the rose family would be in, for example. Okay? So again, this is kind of somewhat kind of the boring stuff, but it's important to me. 625, Story County, 1290, they had six botanists. <laughs> had me and some help, definitely some help. Okay, so I'm feeling pretty good about that. I'm not, you know, I'm not trying to toot my horn, but I think we, we did okay. We're doing okay with that. Okay, another comparison that I tried to do here is, again, I've got uh, the information that I had from Story County. Yeah, this is, this is on here too. So the information that I had from uh, Story County basically mentioned five families that had more than 50, again, I have the word tax on here, I'm talking about species and subspecies, okay. Um, they came up with their top five families that had the most diversity, if you will, okay? And they lined, uh, again, they're, they're starred here, and they lined up perfectly with 
with mine, well, uh, not perfectly, but uh, they, uh, I also, uh, these were my top five families, if you will, from the standpoint of diversity. The Fink restatements, so Fink and Parker samples, um, those were the top five there when I'm looking at the rank there. So I, I actually looked at uh, all of the families and these came up as the top five on all of these uh, survey lists, if you will. The Geiser survey, same thing. So again, what that basically is telling me is that um, I'm, I'm in the right ballpark, okay, for the diversity that we've collected. In the Fink paper, Fink kind of admits, hey, I didn't do a lot of work with sedges. He got 23. I got 67, but I went a little crazy with the sedges, okay. <laughs> My students know. <laughs> As a matter of fact, downstairs after this, if you have some time, downstairs in my botany lab, I've laid out some of these sedges for you to take a look at. You'd be crazy not to want to take a look at it, but. <laughs> Asteraceae family, again, things like uh, sunflowers in there, asters. Uh, Cyperaceae family, uh, the sedge, like I said, the sedge family. Uh, sedges have edges, the triangular uh, stems. Okay, Poaceae, the grass family, again, big one. Fabaceae, legumes, again, things like beans and peas, and then certain cool prairie plants are in there, like lead plant and baptisia. Um, uh, Rosaceae, rose family, again, uh, includes uh, not just roses, but uh, uh, with the GM that I showed you, the prairie smoke. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, uh, oh gosh, apples, uh, cherries, uh, brambles, uh, raspberries, um, all kinds of cool things, okay. So those are, the, again, the five uh, main families, typically, that you'll see. And, li and like I said, yeah, I, I overdid it with the, with the Cyperaceae, but only because I was really interested in them. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of that as we go along here. Um, just a couple things now. I'm not going to give you any more data. I think a couple things is just kind of just showing you some of the pictures of some of the things we got. Uh, in terms of uh, rare species, you can have in Iowa, they have endangered species, threat of being extirpated okay, from Iowa. Uh, threatened species, uh, threatened to become endangered. Special concern species that might become threatened, if you will. So again, three levels of uh, these rare types of species, uh, one Iowa endangered species uh, in the collection, five threatened species, 13 special concern species. This one is probably my favorite, the twin leaf. Um, beautiful, beautiful plant, beautiful woodland plant. Uh, you only find it up here in northeast Iowa in the driftless area in certain places. I'm not going to tell you where they are because <laughs> they're threatened. <laughs> All right. Sometimes I ran across stuff that I wanted to get a voucher specimen and I couldn't because there just wasn't enough of them around. We have a remnant prairie, uh, Plague and Cool Prairie, uh, a little bit northwest of Hawkeye, and found uh, in the past couple years, I've, uh, we did a lot of work. Joshua and others did a lot of work to try to clean that place up. It was getting uh, a little bit overrun by uh, uh, woody encroachment. And uh, all of a sudden, we've been able to see this uh, plant called downy gentian. Typically, you only find it in remnant prairies. Okay, it doesn't like disturbance. Um, but I only found, let's say, I think we found two or three of them this year. Okay, uh, I'm not gonna collect anything like that. If there's not enough of them, I'm not gonna collect them. So the best I can do is photo documentation. So I know that they're there. Okay, it's better than nothing, if you will. But uh, yes, it sure would be nice to have a sample of that, but it's not worth taking it just to have a sample of that, obviously. Uh, where did I not do well? Orchidaceae, but it's not so, pro not so surprising. The family Orchidaceae with the orchids uh, in the old days, if you will. Um, 14 species in Finks and Parkers. And they had some really beautiful gems like, again, the prairie fringed orchid. Uh, I have not found that yet. I've heard that it's around certain places, okay? I, I, again, it's kind of like Pokemon. I'm gonna catch them all if I can catch them all. Okay, but I haven't caught that one yet. Okay, how many have I caught? Four. Not bad, <laughs> okay, but it's not surprising. There probably aren't those, all 14 probably aren't around here in, this, in Fayette County anymore. Okay, uh, they, they're lost. Well, at least lost to this area, if you will. Okay, there's still some of those, of those other species around. Okay, and this is one of them, uh, one of the nice ones, uh, really pretty ones, the yellow lady slippers. Did, was able to find this in, a, in one small patch. Okay, and then of course, carex. I want to end with the carex. 
Okay? About 200 species of carex sedges in the uh, United States, 126 Norris and Zager, they're the ones that uh, I, I took a workshop with them to learn my carex and how to ID the carex. Uh, they, they had maps of 126 species, 53 of them. Uh, they have documentation vouchers uh, from, uh, the, from Fayette County. So we know 53 species, Fayette County, based on their work, you know, that's, that's solid. I, once again, wanted to catch them all. Did I catch them all? Well, I caught 53. Yay, I got them all. No, I didn't. I got some they didn't. I got 11 that they didn't. They still need to be confirmed, so I'm not, I'm not holding myself to 11, but I bet you I found at least four or five for sure. Okay? Uh, we'll work on the other way. Well, I'll get some, an expert in there to help me. But uh, 11 of them, they found that I haven't yet. So I still got some work to do. All right? Um, really quickly, like I said, the, I've got 38 of these, 53. I just, I went crazy last night. I thought, oh, might as well show them to you. So I have them downstairs. You can take a look at them. But they're very interesting. You'll see a lot of diversity, even though they look very similar. They look like grasses, okay, uh, with little seeds on them. But again, uh, there's some differences here. So I'm just going to point these out. So when you go down, maybe you can look for some of these uh, key details. Uh, one, one species, actually this is a special concern species, has uh, male plants that only have male. These are male spikes, we say, with male flowers on, only male flowers. We call them staminate plants. Uh, they have uh, other plants of that species will have just female flowers on. So again, separate male and female plants. We call them staminate and pistillate plants. The pistil is the female part of the plant. So one species is like that, found it in the fen down, down here. Again, I knew it was down there. I'd seen uh, another survey where it was, but I, I found it. I got a documentation of it, though, at least. Uh, some uh, some of these sedges, it's a little bit hard, will have separate male spikes and female spikes on the same plant. But this spike, we say, is all male. These uh, stamina spike, and then these spikes are all female. So that's a very common theme with some of these, probably a good dozen or more. Okay, probably close to two dozen, as a matter of fact. And then you have some really weird things. You have these types here with uh, each of these little uh, blobs here is a, a spikelet. Here, same thing, each of these little blobs is a spikelet, and on that spikelet, they'll have male and female flowers, but on these, these are called androgynous. The, they'll have male flowers on the top of that little sp spikelet, that little bundle, and then they'll have female flowers below it, the pistillate flowers below it, okay? Not all male or all female, but the males, again, above, the females below, and if that's not enough for you to blow your mind, you've got these other types, section of alleys has some really cool ones, little round spikes, and on those spikes, you had the females on the top, and then a little bit of male flowers on the bottom. We call those gynecandrous, gyna, candrous, gyna above, can andrus below, okay? Those are picking up on that old Latin stuff, right? So there, there's, these are the hardest to key out, okay? It's about a dozen of them, found about a dozen of them. It just, it, it took me forever to work on those, to try to figure those out. I'm still not sure I got them all right, but I think I got probably at least eight of them right. All right, so I'm feeling good about that. If you want, I know you wanna see more of these, so you'll have to go downstairs. Okay, 38 of them, you can see them, lay them out. Honestly, it's, it was the most interesting thing I've, I think I've done in a long time. I was so fascinated yesterday, just pulling those out and laying them out. I had never laid them all out like that before. Okay, and now I wanna get the, all, the rest of them, lay them all out, okay, can't wait. I can also, uh, I'll have, I can have down there some of the uh, Parker samples so you can kind of see what they look like, a couple of the, the, the centennial samples, if you'd like to take a look at those. So if you want to, again, I'll, uh, of course, I'm going to stick around uh, here, and if you have questions, I'd be happy to answer your questions, but then uh, feel free, uh, you'll be able to migrate down. I'm going to have Joshua uh, go down there, and uh, he can kind of uh, let you in and uh, let you roam around, okay? Um, uh, future work to do, I just got to keep on working with the uh, phase two and phase threes, okay? A good scientist always has references. Uh, lots of people I'd like to acknowledge, okay? Uh, again, so, some of my uh, colleagues here in particular, and, and definitely the Parker family, uh, including, again, uh, uh, the Gables uh, are, are in with that family. If you want, I can 
talk to you about that, that family a little bit more. Of course, Dom Lammers, okay. Uh, 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 again, all these people were, have been very helpful over the past few, few years, but I want to end with this one, if I can. Um, I probably missed some students, but there's some, uh, several students over the years that have actually helped uh, on their projects, collected uh, survey information, things like that. So um, I'm, uh, it wasn't a project that I did all by myself. Okay. A lot of people contributed, and I'm very thankful to everything that they did. Okay. Uh, that's all I have. If anybody has questions. Anybody has? <laughs> Yes, Jeff. I'm endlessly fascinated by the proclivity of biologists to kill the things they study. Yes. So when you encounter the, the threatened, endangered, at what point do you feel comfortable plucking some away from the Okay, system? yeah, uh, again, I do have a scientific collector's permit, probably, thanks for bringing that up. I have a scientific collector's permit. Usually it says, uh, I need to have a certain number of, of plants there. Usually we're, when you do find some of those threatened species, uh, if, there's, if it's a healthy plant community, you can get away with taking a plant. Um, even if, it, if you are concerned at all, uh, you can just take a part of a plant, again, enough of a plant that where, the, say, the bulb will still be there, or the root, the corn, the root, uh, the rhizome or something, so they'll still be able to grow uh, but that, you took the one uh, flower that, so they'll uh, create one less seed. I will say the one uh, endangered species, I didn't, that, that is not collected, that one was not collected from um, uh, na native uh, materials. Th those, uh, that particular species, the giant blue hyssop, is, I don't think it's been found around Iowa for about 50 years or something like that. So, but it's found in other states seed from other states, made it back into some of our restored prairie down here. So we've actually got it, the, the giant blue hyssop in our restored prairie. Uh, so that is not, um, uh, the DNR isn't quite as worried about that. Well, at least we'll put it that way from the standpoint of me taking a sample of it, be the best way to put it. So yes, I do kind of keep those things in mind. And it is nice that when I do collect plants that they don't, they don't scream, they don't cry, they don't bleed. <laughs> That makes me feel good too. Anything else? Good question. Yes, sir. Um, if you're looking at, are, are you trying to get a full, like, full flora of the county, or are you focusing more on specific smaller ecosystems? Like you've got a number of fence specialists yeah. and yes. things like that, and you know, that's, those are endangered habitats, and, but they're also very conservative habitats. Yeah, it's yeah, a good point. Typically, again, I. I Talk to these colleagues and they were saying, oh boy, it'd be great if you could do a survey of Echo Valley. So that's how it started, okay? I did, started doing a survey of Echo Valley and then while well, we have this remnant prairie, um, the part of, that Upper Iowa takes care of, so yeah, I'll do that. And then next it was, well, I found uh, that Tom Rosberg did a survey uh, at, down in, um, at the, uh, the Fen, the uh, uh, Counts Fen, say out to here. Um, and so it's like, well, I don't know if, I don't think he collected voucher samples, so I'm going to collect voucher samples that we can have here. So yes, it, realistically, it wasn't a, a, intended necessarily to be the, the countywide survey um, with everything else going on in my life, <laughs> you know. So, so yeah, so it was yes, yes, yes. It's one of those hobbies that you just kind of takes over. Uh, if I can continue, I will, but we'll see how long I can continue, so. All right. Yes, Well, uh, with, with those orchids that were found originally that aren't found, is it just habitat loss that you contribute to why you're not finding them? Yeah, uh, uh, again, my understanding would be, you know, some of it is habitat loss. A lot of time with orchids, it is something where they're so pretty, let's take one, you know, let's see if we can plant it at our house. Well, you can't plant it at your house, you know, because you don't have the right micro, uh, micro, uh, uh, microbial communities and so on to kind of keep orchids. Orchids are very f fussy from that standpoint. So, so yes, I think, pro again, it's a little of people taking stuff out, but then the habitat loss as well. So, um, but, and again, uh, you can see uh, there are places where you can find those orchids around in Iowa. So it's not like, and, and probably even in Fayette County, like I said, I'm still kind of working on it. But um, for me, it's like, uh, when I get a chance to go out, uh, okay, I'm looking for this, I'll go here, uh, do I know where it is, and w when it's going to be out, you know, 
it, it, it's kind of that process, and I just haven't done it uh, very uh, religiously with the orchids just yet. So, any others? Any other questions? I think there's still cookies and punch and stuff out there too. So, uh, if you'd like to come up and, and ask questions, uh, I, I, I'll stick around. If you'd like to go down and take a look at the sedges, and I know you all want to, uh, Josh will go down and I'll, I'll try to get down there a little bit later. But thank you all. Yes? Oh, yes? Yeah, sorry. Okay. I need to interrupt. Um, looking around in the room, how many students do we have here right now? Raise your hands. Outstanding. I love it. It's fantastic. And I know we have community members. And I know we have employees. And uh, first of all, Scott, um, honestly, I'm going to just tell you a little story here that took place. I became president in 2013. I think it was within two weeks of that. I had a call from a family, the C.C. Parker family. Mm -hmm. And they were going to come. They wanted to come visit and take a look at the collection that their great, great grandfather had left for them. And I said, no problem. Great to have you here. When you want to do it, we'd like to be here next week. And I said, OK, no problem. So first thing I did, I had no idea what he was talking, what they were talking about. And I contacted, <laughs> I contacted Scott. And Scott goes, you know, I remember seeing some plants and stuff down in the basement. Uh, I'm not mm -hmm. sure if that's it. So he went down, and oh my gosh, it was. And it was a very old collection, obviously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what really got all this started. But the main thing was, was that he went in there, he pulled it all together. They came over there. They weren't real pleased. They wanted to expect, they expected more, but at least it was there, we had it, and then we had made a commitment, we will expand yeah. on this. Yeah, I brought, I, brought, I brought them two, and they're like, yeah. well, where's the rest? Where's the other 500? <laughs> 498. So, I was like, I'll work on that. <laughs> been, uh, I, it's, it's amazing what's been accomplished from absolutely such a minimal uh, amount of attention. And the university never really knew what treasures it had here. Mm. until really Scott was able to do this, bring in other people, and do yeah. all the things that have been done. So yeah. every year it's gotten better and better. And uh, C.C. Park and that whole family, I, I visit with him and I visit with his, all C.C. Parker's uh, great-grandchildren, mm. great-great-grandchildren. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're so committed to this university and so proud of this university. But I really have to say, if it wasn't for Scott, I'm not sure what would have happened. Um, I, I didn't know any of the faculty. I remember when I first got here, I wanted to meet certain faculty. When I asked the president who was here as a VP, I remember I wanted to meet with certain faculty, and Scott was one of them, so that was the one who I called, and it just happened to be the right one. But, I mean, a big round of applause for Scott. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So, so the other thing I want to do is um, we have our employee uh, we get the annual employee awards, and uh, Scott's did not show up for some reason. I think it was something about maybe they had to verify that you deserved it. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, they caught me. years of service. He was not uh, here to see, but I think this is such a great way to present it right now. And I want you to open it in front of the oh. folks here. <laughs> so, this is for his 30 years of service award plus. And I can tell you, he's one of the most kindest and generous. Uh, a brilliant uh, individual who just has done tremendous things for the university, for our students, for the alumni, everybody. And I look out here and I see people shaking their heads yes and stuff. And so that's who we have. Here. So congratulations. He's going to take and pull this out. And this is an award for the ser service. It's a box. It's a white box. It <laughs> <laughs> has orchid seeds in it, doesn't it? <laughs> I don't know if I can open it. <laughs> to what he found when he went down to the basement you know, some time ago. Oh! <laughs> you know, we, we, we touch here a little bit. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Gosh, I hope I don't break it. Oh, look and, at that. And inscribed UIU, uh, China. Uh, China. Uh. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. Uh, so thanks a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank you all for being here. Wow. <laughs>
thanks again for coming. We really appreciate it. If you uh, want to hang around for a couple questions, great. Uh, or maybe I'll see you downstairs. I hope to. Okay. Thanks.